the Sabbath to each and every one of you. We want to thank the Lord in a special way for yet another Sabbath that we can spend in the presence of the Lord. We are continuing with our mental hygiene series entitled Surviving a Crisis Through the Mind of Christ. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for your grace and your mercy upon us. Thank you, Lord, for the interest that you have in our minds, that we may develop a mind as that which Christ had and enjoy the peace that he gives us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, so our title of this mental hygiene series is entitled Surviving a Crisis Through the Mind of Christ. And my name is Charles F. Kleser. The title for this Sabbath is Overcoming Anger, God's Way, Part One. Last Sabbath, we discussed about bitterness, how to deal with bitterness, and that was the part two of that particular title. And in this title, our key Bible texts come from the book of James chapter one, verse 19 to 20. And I'm going to be reading from the King James uh, Version Bible, the book of James chapter one, verse 19 and 20. That's where I'm going to be reading from. Verse 19, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Verse 20, for the wrath of men worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, my brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God already in these two verses is riveted one of the principles that we can make use in dealing with anger. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, slow to get angry. Another word for wrath would be angry. For the anger of man or the wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God. The anger of man, or when man gets angry, it does not assist or help him in being righteous before God. It does not help him in right doing before God. So we're going to ask Christ these particular questions because we want to have the mind of Christ. We want to drink from the fountain that does not fail, of which after drinking from it, we'll never be thirsty again and we we'll have been would have actually learned how to deal with anger. What is anger? Should we get angry? These are the questions that we're going to ask the carpenter of Nazareth, Jesus Christ himself. Is all anger bad? What about righteous indignation? Causes of anger, the physiology of anger. Why does anger make us feel uncomfortable? Is anger always destructive? Can it be used creatively? How to be angry without sinning? What can I do to overcome the sin of anger? So these are the questions that we're going to ask Jesus Christ that he may help us to be able to deal with anger. The key Bible text that we're going to make use of is Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, James chapter 1, verses 2 to 5, verses 6 to 8, verse 11 to 14, verse 15 to 18, verse 19 to 22, verse 23 to 27, Matthew chapter 5, verse 22, the book of Proverbs 16, verse 32 to 33. Let's define anger. What is anger? From the Merriam Dictionary, it says that it's a feeling. So Merriam Dictionary explains anger as a feeling. And it says, a strong feeling of annoyance, displeasure, or hostility. That is the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. 
Then from the medical psychological dictionary, it says that it's a feeling of tension and hostility, usually caused by anxiety aroused by a perceived threat to one's self, possessions, rights, or values. Another definition, anger is also defined as a violent passion. This is coming from the Noah Webster dictionary. A violent passion of the mind excited by a real or supposed injury, usually accompanied with a propensity to take visions or to obtain satisfaction from the offending party. This passion, however, varies in degrees of violence and in ingenious minds may be attended only with a desire to reprove or chide the offender. And then from the writings of Ellen White, it's put across and it's very clear that indulged anger is a sin that we can overcome. It's the same principle that we find in the Bible. I'm reading from the book, Second Mind, Character and Personality, page 516, paragraph two. And she begins by quoting the book of Romans chapter six, verse 16. His servants ye are to whom ye obey. If we indulge anger, number one, lust, number two, covetousness, number three, hatred, number four, selfishness, number five, or any other sin, we become servants of sin. She quotes the book of Matthew, chapter six, verse 24. No man can serve two masters. This is the counsel that we are getting. And in the list of sins, we find anger, anger being put as the first one, then comes lust, then comes covetousness, then hatred, then selfishness, or any other sin. So anger is here put across as sin. Indulged anger is a sin that we can overcome. Should we get angry? Then people begin to ask questions. Should we get angry? The book of Jonah, chapter four, verse nine, we find God asking Jonah a question because he was given a mission to go and minister to the people of Nineveh. When he went there, he was not expecting them to repent. When they repented, he decided that it was not one of the best things that he was expecting. In actual effect, he was also thinking that the people of Jonah, of the, the people of Nineveh, will not accept him as a true prophet. So therefore, when they repented, this is what Jonah went through. He actually ran into the desert and he desired himself that he might die. And God said to Jonah, do as thou well to be angry for the God. This was after the Lord had put, uh, had made a God to grow overnight and give him shade during the day. And then the Lord caused a worm to come and uh, take the shade away from him. And then he was angry. And the Lord now is asking Jonah, do as thou well to be angry for the God? And he said, I do well to be angry, even to death. So here, Jonah is saying to the Lord, I do well to be angry and even to death. In ultra essence, there are some people that have been known to die during a conversation that was a debate where someone is very angry and they want their side to win the, the particular debate. And of course, there might have been other underlying challenges that the person has got, but anger is the one that actually triggered the person to actually die. And here we find the same, Jonah desiring that he may die because he's angry. But in actual essence, in the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 26 to 27 and 29, God gives us the principles by which we can approach anger, not to the point of death or desiring to die, as we find with, with Jonah. The book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 26 to 27 says, Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. The Lord is saying, because we're living in the sinful world, there are things that are bound to press some buttons upon our lives that we are not aware that we used to have them. We can become annoyed. We can become distrust, dis, distracted by things. We can be provoked by different uh, things that can come through our way in our environment, by different attitudes, by different people or circumstances. And the Lord is saying, be ye angry. You can get angry but do not sin in your anger. 
Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Do not cherish or indulge in that particular wrath. Neither give place to the devil, verse 27. For when anger is indulged or cherished or natured, then one begins to begins to think of ways of revenging or doing other things that are more sinister in a way. And this comes as a result of the enemy, that is the devil, bringing in suggestions and thoughts of revenge. Verse 29, how then can we do this? Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. So the Lord is saying, you can get angry, and when you are angry, see not. Do not indulge or cherish this particular anger. And one way to deal with it, always make sure that there's no corrupt communication coming out of your mouth. You avoid being angry. Proverbs 16, verse 32. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh the city. Friends, here already we are learning that the Lord is saying, he that is slow to anger. So being slow to anger. Should we get angry? We may get angry. And when we get angry, we should be slow to get angry. And when then we are angry, we should not sin. We should not indulge upon the sin. We should not let the sin. We should not let the anger dwell or we should not dwell upon this particular anger. And he that ruleth his spirit, than he that taketh a city. Self-control is very important, ruling the spirit. It is far much better to be able to have self-control than to have all the physical energy to take a city as it would happen in the olden days when there would be wars for different uh, places as far as the Bible is concerned in the Old Testament time as we find with the Philistines and the Israelites when um, the times when they would engage in physical battle. And the Lord here is saying, it is better for one not to be able to overcome a city by himself if they cannot have self-control, if they are quick to anger. The book of Ecclesiastes chapter seven, verse nine, do not be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. If anything, to be quick to anger or to be haste and the attitude of getting angry is an indication that we need wisdom from God. For, for one to cease from being foolish, they need to ask from God for wisdom. James chapter one, verse 19 to 21, we read this one. What we are trying to, what we want to establish here is, should we get angry? Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. So the Lord is saying, be slow to get angry. For the wrath or the anger of man worketh not the righteousness of God. So what are we going to do? Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engraved word the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers on deceiving your own selves. The Lord Jesus Christ is giving us here counsel pertaining what we are supposed to do as the children of the Lord, slow to get angry. And one of the things that will help us to become slow to get ang in getting angry is in essence, laying aside all filthiness, all superfluity of naughtiness, and to receive the word of Lord into our lives that it may change us and that our souls may be served. Not just that, but to be the doers of the word, not hearers only. For if we do that, we deceive ourselves. If we hear only and not do what the word of the Lord says. James chapter one, verse five. So this calls for us to ask for wisdom. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. And the Lord will give us 
the wisdom that we need in dealing with anger. So anger is an important part of our emotional packaging that God gave, that, that, that God allowed our physiological systems to go through as a result of sin. Hence, he wants us to overcome this feeling that we may not sin. Anger is an important part of our emotional packaging. While all our feelings have been tainted by sin, the gospel has the power to change our lives and our emotions. I'm reading from the book, Minister of Healing, page 485, paragraph one. Self is the enemy we most need to fear. No form of vice has a more baleful effect upon the character than has human passion not under the control of the Holy Spirit. No other victory we can gain will be so precious as the victory gained, gained over self. Self-control is very important. And if we can obtain self-control, we'll be able to deal with anger. The book chart guidance, page 95, paragraph one. Never should we lose control of ourselves. Let us ever keep before us the perfect pattern. It is a sin to speak impassionately and frightful, or to feel angry, even though we do not speak. We are to walk worthy, giving a right representation of Christ. The speaking of an angry word is like flint striking flint. It at once kindles wrathful feelings. Friends, the counsel that we're getting here is we should learn self-control. For the Lord has laid a perfect pattern before us to overcome self. And in actual essence, feeling angry, but not speaking or expressing it in word is still sin. We are to walk worthy, giving a right representation of Christ. We are Christians, Christians. We are supposed to give an example to the world of Christ. We should not speak in an angry way. We should not become angry and indulge in this anger. We should not allow our feelings to be easily wounded. We are to live, not to guard our feelings or our reputation, but to save our souls. Many people become angry and express anger and its powerful effects because many times we are guarding our feelings, our reputations, instead of working to save souls. The Book of Ministry of Healing, page 485, Paragraph two. Next question, is all anger bad? So we have defined anger, what it is. We, are, we also answer the question, are we supposed to get angry? Now we are looking at, is all anger bad? So I'm going to look at Raya Rasha's indignation. There are quite a number of examples in the Bible, but I've chosen to take the example of Christ and use that one as the one that we're going to to, to make use of as far as this uh, presentation is concerned, as far as anger is concerned. So I'm going to take the account where Christ cleanses the temple, because many people use that as an excuse to say Christ got angry and he expressed his anger in a um, physical and forceful way. But let's see if that is what happened. Righteous indignation, the book, the book Deserve Ages, page 310. It is true, there is an, an indignation that is justifiable, even in the followers of Christ, when they see that God is dishonored and his service is brought into disrepute, when they see the innocent oppressed, a righteous indignation stares the soul. Such anger born of sensitive morals is not a sin, but those who at any supposed provocation feel at liberty to indulge anger or resentment are opening the heart to Satan. Bitterness and animosity must be banished from the soul if we would be in harmony with the heaven. Testament to ministers, page 100. It is a righteous indignation against sin, which springs from zeal for the glory of God, not that anger prom prompted by self-love or wounded ambition, which is referred to in scripture, be ye angry and sin not. Such was the anger of Moses when he was holding the two tablets of stones and is coming down from the mountain and he realized what the children of God has done, they'd let go of the worship of God. And then in anger, he threw down 
the two tablets of stone that had the Ten Commandments as an indication to show that what they were doing was not acceptable in the presence of God. <clears throat> so we need to rightly understand, for example, Christ's indignation over the temple marketers. The book of John chapter 2, verse 13 to 17, gives us the first Passover experience where Christ did the first cleansing of the temple. And I'm going to read the account, verse 18 up to 17. And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the money, the, the changers money and overthrew the tables and said unto them that sold doves, take these things hence, make not my father's house and house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. The temple is defiled. The worship is not in the way that is supposed to be done. The forgiveness of sin. The sacrificial system had been uh, used as a money-making business by the priests. And here Christ, as he approaches the temple, he, all this is before him. And in right under indignation for what was being done, he deals with the situation. And then on the fourth Passover, there was the second cleansing of the temple. Matthew chapter 21, verse 12 to 13. It says, and Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seeds of them that sold doves. And said unto them, it is written, my house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. And I'm going to read from the book Deserve Ages, page 158, paragraph two. How did Christ really drive the people out of the temple? How did Christ really deal with these people? How was the scenario like? We want to get into the shoes of Christ. We want to get into the eyes of the people that were in the temple as their tables were being overturned and those that served salt doves were being driven out of the temple. It says, slowly descending the steps and raising the scourge of cords gathered up on entering the enclos the enclosure. <clears throat> he bids the bargaining company depart from the presence of the temple. Friends, I want us to take this in and understand it well. Christ is approaching the temple. He's approaching the entrance of the temple. They were descending steps. And under righteous anger, indignation, wrath, for the abominations that were being done in the temple, Christ did not run down the temple in anger. It says he slowly descended the steps, raising the scourge of cords gathered up upon entering the closure. And he bids the bargaining company depart from the precinct of the temple. In actual essence, when you study further in the book Desire of Ages, it says that when Christ was descending the, step, the steps, the people, when they focused their eyes upon Christ, his presence condemned their activities. And the eyes of Christ were as if it was piercing through their hearts and souls to the sin that they were indulging in. And they departed in haste. With a zeal and severity, he has never before manifested. He overthrows the tab of the money changers. Jesus does not smite them with the weep of cords. Friends, Jesus did not smite them with the weep of cords, but in his hand, that simple scourge seems terrible as a flaming sword. <clears throat> Officers of the temple, speculating priests, brokers and cattle traders with their sheep and auction, oxen rush from the place with the one thought of escaping from the condemnation of his presence. That which condemned them was his presence. It's not being burdened as in corporal punishment that made them to leave the place, but his presence. 
of course Christ overthrew the, the, the tables of the money changers because Christ was 100% human as we are. And we are going to learn the physiological aspect of anger. But here Christ did not discipline these people as what some other people would do, where they would say they're going to beat up somebody because they are angry and give Christ's example as an excuse. That is a misapplied and misunderstanding of what Christ did. We are learning here that Christ did not smite or beat them with a whip of cords. But in actual instance, his presence is the one that condemned them. And they rushed out of the marketplace in the temple that they'd established there from the condemnation that was before them. Now, let's look at what causes anger. Number one, careless inattention to the laws of health. This can cause anger, or it can cause one not to be able to deal with anger in the right way. Number one, careless inattention to the laws of health. For example, sleep hygiene, irregular hours can cause one to become irritable and quick to anger. Indulgence of appetite is the greatest cause of physical and mental debility. When the mental faculties are debilitating, one can lose the ability to be able to control themselves when they are angry or to be slow to get angry. Second mind, character and personality, page 386, paragraph three. People who have a sour stomach are very often of a sour disposition. Everything seems to be contrary to them and they're inclined to be peevish and irritable. So the condition of the stomach or the condition of the digestive system has got a lot to do with our disposition, how we deal with anger. We talked about this more when we talked about uh, nutrition, um, its role as far as mental hygiene is concerned, its role as far as our brain and our mind is concerned. This is coming from the book, Second Mind, Cartoon Personality, page three at seven, paragraph two. For you to learn more about this, go back to our presentations on our YouTube channel and Facebook channel, and you'll be able to go through uh, this particular presentation, the role of nutrition uh, as far as mental hygiene is concerned. Everything seems to be contrary to them. They're inclined to be peevish and irritable. If we would have peace among ourselves, we should give more thought than we do to having a peaceful stomach. Manuscript, manuscript 41, pay of 1908. The gut condition, that is the digestive system, contributes greatly to self-control when it comes to dealing with anger. So number one, the cause of anger, the causes that can lead one to be quick to get angry, careless in attention to the laws of health, which can include intemperance, a lack of trust in God, not having enough water can contribute also one not being able to, um, to enjoy self-control. Number two, canal attitudes. Number three, unmet needs such as boredom, injustice, insecurity, envy, poor health habits, sickness, humiliation, embarrassment, failures, rejection, insufficient privacy of space, frustrations, physical limitations, a sense of hopelessness. Anger is also excited by an injury offered to, 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 to a relation, friend or party to which one is attached. And some degree, and some degrees of it may be ex excited by cruelty, injustice, or oppression offered to those with whom one has no immediate connection or even to the community of which one is a member. Nor is it unusual to see something of this passion roused by gross obscenities in others, especially in controversy or discussion. Anger may be inflamed till it rises to rage and a temporary delirium. Noah Webster Dictionary. Number four, misinterpretations and faulty thinking patterns. We also discussed faulty thinking patterns in our previous presentations. Please take a look at them and go through faulty thinking patterns. And as you begin to apply those ones, you actually begin to realize that you are beginning to have self-control. You are beginning now to be slow to get angry. For example, someone might say, when I am angry, I become quiet. So when you are quiet, you must be angry too. So this is a, a faulty thinking pattern. This is a misinterpretation of what the other person might be thinking or going through or trying to express themselves. Unrealistic expectation can also lead to anger. 
childhood upbringing, the first three years of a child's life is very important. The first 1,000 years of uh, 1,000 days of a child's life are very important. Let selfishness, anger, and self-will have its cause for the first three years of a child's life. And it would be hard to bring it to submit to wholesome discipline. Its disposition has become soft. It delights in having its own way. Parental control is distasteful. These evil tendencies grow with, with its growth. Until in manhood, supreme selfishness and a lack of self-control placing at the mercy of the evils that ran riot in the land, the health reformer, April 1877. How parents discipline their children. If parents discipline their children out of anger and frustration without taking time to ask God to help them to be calm, to pray and help us to deal with the situation. Because children learn by observation, they also imitate the same thing. They will retaliate to the parent in anger, in expressing anger and vengeful expressions. When they grow into adulthood, they will also be doing the same thing. But praise be unto God, there is hope. This is not a destiny because we have the example where we, through Jesus Christ, we can do all things and become different and overcome the sin of anger. Number seven, rejection of God's teaching. Ultimately, when it comes to the causes of anger, not being able to slow to get angry, and when we are angry, not seeing, being able to remain calm and deal with the situation in the most Christian way as it should be with calm faith and calm hope, it's all because of rejection of God's teachings. Let's look at the physiology of anger. Of all the moods people want to escape, anger seems to be the most seductive, stubborn, and hard to control. Propelled by self-righteousness monologue, it fills the mind with the most convincing arguments until we feel compelled to vent out, to vent out our rage. <clears throat> While sadness can drag you down, Anger can be energizing, even somewhat exhilarating. These adverse health effects of anger are well documented. They include headache, digestive problems, abdo abdo abdominal pain, insom insomnia, increased anxiety, depression, high blood pressure, skin problems such as eczema and even heart attack. How many people today are sick of heart attack, eczema? high blood pressure, depression, anxiety, insomnia, abdominal pain, indigestion, and they're not re recovering from that particular challenge. And hence, at the same time, they cherish or indulge anger. There is a need for such to realize the role anger plays as far as their particular uh, health problem is concerned and to begin to deal with it accordingly. This emotion of anger is fueled by our thoughts. In the past, we learned that thoughts and feelings combined together make up our character. And here, the feelings precede thoughts and the emotion of anger is fueled by our thoughts. If we feel insulted, threatened or ashamed, it sets off an Olympic surge in the brain, releasing catecholamines in, respond, in response to the stress. So there is this fight or flight hormones that generate a rush of energy that lasts for several minutes. Meanwhile, another wave of hormones swells from the lower emotional portion of the brain, the amygdala, through a branch of the neuroendocrine system preparing the brain for physical action. <clears throat> Thus, when this is not, when one is, is going through this particular fight or flight mode, it is best not to suppress the physical um, energy that is being generated by the body. And one of the ways to do that is to leave the presence of the person or the presence of the environment that is making you angry through a walk and to pray not just that, but even to go for an exercise or even a hot and cold contrast bath, which helps this particular 
energy to be used up in the process and the lactic acid that is accumulating and the muscles to be dealt away with and there will only be pain on the joints as a result of the flight of fight hormones that are now uh, being released by the body. The second stage is that which keeps the brain in a state of readiness. It can last much longer than the first for hours or even days. This heightened state enables subsequent reactions to be built with a particular quickness. This finger on the trigger condition explains why people who have already been provoked or slightly irritated are so much more prone to an outburst. So friends, when we are angry, our body gets ready for fight or flight. And that's why you find some people, they hit their desk and the papers on their desk fly everywhere. Some people handle other people. And for some, they suppress the anger and they put their fists together, they grind their teeth and their mouth begins to shake. And some can even literally shake the whole body as they're trying to suppress uh, this particular energy and uh, desire and zeal to, to, to manhandle the situation that is before them. It's almost like when you meet a lion, uh, these particular hormones are important. They help us to run away from the lion uh, when we have seen a snake to deal with the snake and kill it. And the same thing happens when one is angry. And now <clears throat> it is high time that we learn how to handle these particular hormonal sage that comes into, into our lives uh, when we get angry. For if we then cherish this particular kind of hormonal expression all the time, getting angry and expressing it in physical, sage and all kind of uh, unspeakable things, we tend to cause the system to be overcome by this particular kind of state of emergency. We cannot remain in a state of emergency all while. It's only for a short while and deal with it accordingly. On the opposite end of the spectrum lies an equally deadly mood, anger, suppression. So that, that is anger, expression. Then on the other side, there is anger, suppression. This emotional state is misinformed by the idea that anger can and must be expressed, suppressed at all costs. Though some psychologists teach that unvented anger can cause physical and psychological problems, the free expression of anger is worse because it is both unpleasant and dangerous. We need not freely express our anger. When I say freely, I'm talking here about physical expression of venting out. Some people have actually broken their limbs in trying to express their anger, in trying to express a point in a debate or in a discussion by banging the desk. Rather than offer relief, the free expression of anger tends to reinforce and increase fury by pumping up the brain's arousal system. While there may be some instances where angry communication appears therapeutic, venting anger is one of the worst ways to cool down. One of the best ways to cool down is to get down on your knees and pray and ask God for strength. Or to go for a walk, excuse yourself from the environment, go for a jog, use up the energy, go for a cold, hot and cold contest bath so as to relax the muscles. So as to do away with the lactic acid, that is the byproduct of this particular flight and fight, the hormones expression that comes through the adrenaline as it is being pumped by the, bo by the body ready for fight or for flight. And actually, when one does not deal with it in the right way, it can release some acids into the stomach and can actually lead to uh, acidiosis, ulcers, and even heartburn. But anger, now reading from the book 40, page 431. So now we are going to look at the writings of Ellen White. We want to find out further about the physiology of anger. But anger was cherished for the time being. Reason was dethroned and the heart was made prey to ungovernable passion. When anger is cherished, reason, the frontal lobe is the part of the brain that is responsible for reason, 
it becomes dethroned and it won't be able to make the right decisions. Many people have made wrong decisions when they were angry and we need not fall into the same trap for we are learning the right way. The book of education, page 197, the influence of the mind on the body as well as the body on the mind should be emphasized. The electric power of the brain, the, promote, the electrical power of the brain promoted by mental activity vitalizes the whole system and is thus an invaluable aid in resisting disease. This should be made plain. Friends, let's exercise our brains by studying the Bible, studying the book of Revelation and Daniel and understanding the prophecies for the time. Self-development, be willing to develop yourself further as far as your education is concerned, understanding the principles of life and how best to live life to the fullest. So we need not become idle or be content with a dull mind. Let us increase our intellectual capabilities and understanding of the different aspects of life. The power of the will, the importance of self-control, both in the preservation and the recovery of health, the depressing and even ruinous effect of anger, discontent, selfishness, or impurity. And on the other hand, the marvelous life-giving power to be found in cheerfulness and selfishness, gratitude, should also be shown. Our high call in page 235, when one once gives place to an angry spirit, he's just as much intoxicated as the man who has just put <coughs> the glass to his lips. Now, the glass to his lips that is being referred to here is alcohol. And here we are learning that when one gives way to the spirit of angry or being angry and they indulge upon it and enjoy doing it. They're as much intoxicated as the man who takes alcohol or who is a drunkard. What this means is the after effects of being angry when the lactic acid is being poured by the body outside of the, from the muscles as, as a result of the adrenaline that was pumping and one did not manage to express their anger in the right way. In the, as the body is trying to deal, out, to deal with this particular acidic environment that has been created as the liver is trying to cleanse the system to detoxify itself. When it is daily encouraged this anger, then one becomes intoxicated as much as one who has got the glass to his lips. Anger compromises frontal lobe ability our high calling, page 235. The man who gives way to folly in speaking passionate words bears false witness for he is never just. He aggravates every defect he thinks he sees. He is too blind and unreasonable to be convinced of his madness. He transgresses the commandments of God and his imagination is perverted by the inspiration of Satan. He knows not what he's doing, blind and deaf. He permits Satan to take the helm and guide him wherever he pleases. The door is then thrown open to malice, to envy, to evil surmisings, and the poor victim is born helpless on. But there is hope. While the hours of probation linger through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Some are nervous. And if they begin to lose self-control in word or spirit under provocation, they as much intoxicated the wrath as the inebriate is with liquor. They are unreasonable and not easily persuaded or convinced. They are not sane. Satan for the time is full control. Every one of these exhibitions of wrath weakens the nervous system and moral powers and makes it, sub it, makes it difficult to restrain anger or another provocation. With this class, there's only one remedy, positive self-control under all circumstances. Lack of self-control weakens the nervous system. It can cause lack of sleep. It can cause difficulty in restraining anger. The effort to get into a favorable place where self is not, is not to be annoyed may succeed for a time, but Satan knows where to find these poor souls and will sell them in their weak points again and again. So for some, they give this particular solution to say, excuse yourself from that particular environment 
but not dealing with the anger. So this is the anger suppression. So anger suppression here, we are learning that it's not one of the best. It can help us to succeed for that particular time, but Satan will always be finding means and ways again to throw his darts upon us. And before we know it, one day we express our anger that we've been suppressing for all the years. They will be continually troubled so long as they think so, so much of self. They carry the heaviest load a mortal can lift. That is self and sanctified and unsub unsubdued. But there is hope for them. Let this life, so stormy with conflicts and waters, be brought into connection with Christ, and then self will no longer clamor for the supremacy. Our supreme solution when it comes to dealing with anger is Jesus Christ. We need to accept him as our personal savior and who overcome our tendencies to get angry. Youthful, youthful instructor, a youth instructor, page, youth instructor, November 10, 1886. Common unhealthy responses due to anger. So we're going to look at some of the common unhealthy responses due to anger. Why do people have suppressed anger? Some have been taught that their feelings and emotions are invalid. Sometimes they feel morally superior and can have an overall need for approval from respectable people. So these are some of the causes that cause unhealthy responses to anger. For some people, it is because they want to be approved by respectable people. Sometimes they want to feel morally superior and they've been taught that feelings and emotions are invalid. This is why some people uh, fail to control themselves and therefore uh, they have an unhealthy way in responding to anger. Also fear of retaliation. Number one, withdrawing or avoiding or hiding is an unhealthy way of expressing anger as what Jonah did. Running away from the responsibility and the Lord helped him through to his responsibility. When he has done the responsibility quite well, he ran away also from seeing the results because when he saw that the people had repented, <laughs> he was not happy turning inward, as in the case with King Saul and David. Let's look at the book of Proverbs, chapter 19, verse 12. What does the, what does the wrath of a king do? The book of Proverbs, chapter 19, I'm going to read verse 12. Proverbs, chapter 19, I'm going to read verse 12. The king's wrath is as the roaring of a lion, but his favor is as dew upon the grass. When a king is angry, it's not one of the best things to, to enjoy, even for anybody else, but favor is like dew on the grass in the morning. Physical symptoms include headaches, ulcers, high blood pressure, heart attacks. Psychological symptoms of turning inward, fear, anxiety, tension, depression, Thinking characterized, characterized by self-pity, thoughts of revenge, or ruminations or in, on injustices, such as what King Saul did. King Saul and David. The key text that I'm going to use is 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 14. 1 Samuel chapter 16, I'm going to use verse 14. Verse 14, but the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. Early in his reign, under the tutelage of the prophet Samuel, King Saul had been the great champion of Israel, pushing its enemies back and making good progress in forging a nation out of the 12 tribes. Yet, just about the time David came on the scene, he, became, he began to display severe emotional problems exacerbated by the spirit of the Lord departing from Saul and a distressing, distressing spirit from the Lord troubling him. Saul 
when David came up in his life, in the children of Israel's experience. And he began to show indication that the Lord is guiding and leading him. And as the people begin to have more favor for David than King Saul, King Saul began to show some weaknesses as far as emotional expression is concerned. And as a result of perpetuating or dwelling upon that, the spirit of the Lord departed from him and Satan take, took control of King Saul. Saul had rejected God's counsel on self-control and therefore Saul's mind was taken over by a demon that caused Saul distress. Characterized by severe melancholy, fits of silence and anger, and only David's playing of his harp was able to drive the demon away. Friends, anger can be perpetuated by demon possession as a result of not heeding the voice of the Lord to self-control. In actual essence, music can lead one to get angry and have high blood pressure. At the same time, calm music can actually help someone to be able to deal with emotional challenges. In actual essence, in one study, there was a child that was in hospital and this particular child was going through different emotional challenges. When they played rock and metallic music, the child's high blood pressure went up, the muscles become tense and his expression of anger, revenge was more calculated and the percentage was very high as opposed to when they played classical musical instruments that such as the harp and the piano when it's played within the context of calming and relaxing music in the presence of a Christian environment. And they noted that music in actual essence can actually lead to expression of anger in sage, which is not righteous in, in, in its expression and the results thereof. From the book of 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 8, we learn that once Daniel, once David had slain Goliath and begun to receive acclamation from the people, Saul became murderously jealous of his young servant. Saul's distress soon whacked into real anger and suspicion. And the next time David came to play his harp for Saul, the king cast a spear at him, shouting, I'll pin David to the wall. When anger has gotten its fullness, just like seeing the results is death. People begin to have a desire to kill or even to take their own life, commit suicide, such as we find with Jonah. The younger man escaped only to have the scene repeated some time later. Not long thereafter, David had to flee and hide in the wilderness, simply because the king had no self-control. Acting out is another way of not expressing anger in the right way. Aggression, behavior that inflicts pain or pressure upon others, such as direct aggression, which is blunt and forceful, a voice becomes increasingly louder, <coughs> <clears throat> excuse me, voice becomes increasingly louder as convictions are voiced. <clears throat> when something goes wrong, focus so sharply on fixing the problems that others' feelings are overlooked. So direct aggression has got to do with mainly when someone focuses on fixing the problem than considering other people's feelings when something goes wrong and also increasing the voice, it becomes very loud and blunt and forceful in trying to drive the point they want to say or getting the solution. Open aggression can involve arising from a focus that so strongly emphasizes personal needs that there is a powerful insensitivity to the needs of others. Explosiveness, rage, intimidation, blaming, bakering, criticism or sarcasm result. Out in the wilderness, David had two perfect opportunities to kill Saul, who was now his father-in-law and persecutor. But David's humble upbringing and life as a shepherd had taught him valuable lessons of self-control. 
at the point that even God called him a man after my own heart. Friends, from the book of 1 Samuel chapter 26, verse 1 to 25, 1 Samuel chapter 24, verse 1 to 22, and Acts chapter 13, verse 22, we learn that when they self-control, even when given the opportunity to kill someone who actually is trying to kill you as an individual or who is causing you lots of distress, one can actually contain themselves, pray for that person and wish them well. First Samuel chapter 31, verse 1 to 13. I'm not going to read those verses. But from these particular verses, we learn that Saul was highly susceptible to demonic influence and emotional instability. The distressing spirit that God allowed to torment him had played with his emotions for years. And it is likely that as he aged, as David eluded capture, and as the Philistines grew in strength, Saul only became more depressed and fearful. By the time he was camped on the slopes of Mount Gilboa, brooding over the advance of the Philistines' army into camp on the opposite side, he was in a state of severe misery and near, near terror, eventually ending his life by committing suicide. Anger, when it's not managed, when it's not controlled, when we cannot control ourselves, when we do not surrender ourselves to Jesus Christ for strength, Ultimately, when sin has gotten its full reward, it is death, for the wages of sin is death. And here we find King Saul committing suicide. Another way of not expressing anger in the right way is passive, ag passive aggression. Anger is vented in subtle ways, such as gossip, forget what they promised, refuse to cooperate, make put downs. In other words, instead of physical expression of, um, of, of anger in a way of trying to suppress one's failure to deal with anger or having to sit down and talk things out. Anger is vented in subtle ways, such as gossip, refusal to cooperate. When frustrated, one becomes silent, knowing it bothers other people, prone to sulk and pout or complain about people behind their backs. When don't want to do a project, they procrastinate. Displaced anger. Is another way. Aggressive anger aimed at somebody who's innocent. Suppressed anger has got the following characteristics. Very image conscious. They don't like to let others know problems. Even when they feel very frustrated, they portray themselves publicly as having it all together. Reserved about sharing problems. If a family member upsets them, they can let days pass by without even mentioning it and they have a tendency to be depressed and moody. Resentful thinking is common, does not eliminate anger. It accrues and reduces immune function. But in God's word, there are contained principles that are numerous gems that we can use in dealing with anger. And friends, we need to learn how to control ourselves, not to suppress anger, at the same time, not to vent out in a sage and reap the powerful effects. As we have found here, there are some people that suppress it. They don't talk about it. And they pretend as if everything is OK, everything is well, when in actual essence, it's not so. When tempted to become angry, the best strategy is always to keep quiet about the momentary irritations. Take time to think and reevaluate the situations momentarily. By controlling your anger in these ways, you are also less likely to provoke the person you are angry with into further retaliation. Feelings of anger will happen to all of us at times. But these feelings need to be elevated to our consciousness where any thinking distortion can be analyzed and then corrected. Let's look at Christian assertiveness. You have needs that are important. I also have needs that are equally important. Christian assertiveness recognizes that everyone has needs and these needs are important. It includes prayerfully choosing our priorities and values and putting forth efforts to meet our needs in, in a godly way. Being con considerate of and respecting others, others' needs and desires as well. It is unselfish in that we need to recharge our batteries so as to give to others 
we do not engage in meeting our needs in such a selfish way that we do not reach out to others. This is coming from Elizabeth Holm. Facing anger in a Christian way means that I recognize it as such and I'm willing to explore any issue of personal fear or sense of inferiority that underlies the anger. I confess it to Jesus and seek to honestly deal with the anger in a responsible way, including appropriate communication and forgiveness. Friends, I'm going to pray with you. I don't want to pray with someone who says, Lord, I'm struggling with anger. I didn't know that actually, if I am not happy with something and I keep it within myself and do not cooperate or do not forgive, it's actually a sin. Lord, I want to stop this. I want to live a life of happiness. I want to live a life full of peace. Give me wisdom that I may be able to deal with anger. I want to implement the principles that I, I'm learning, that I've learned today and that I've learned so far. If this is your prayer, pray with me this afternoon. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray for your children today who have been listening to this presentation, that have gone through the different steps that we have learned, what causes anger, whether we should get angry, what is righteous indignation, and the physiology of anger, how not to suppress anger or how to express anger in a healthy way. We do not know how best to implement these principles. Principles. We need wisdom. We need grace that comes from your presence that we may be able to live a life that is full of peace, that is full of joy in your presence. We want to learn to be slow to anger. We want to Lord to be quick to hear, quick to forgive. But for our own selves, Lord, we are not able to do this. Help us today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you so much for taking your time. We'll continue next Sabbath. Please go through what you have learned today uh, and share with your friends, share with your family members and schoolmates, and you'll be blessed as the Lord ministers to your needs. Amen. Mm -hmm.